Great. Uh, welcome to everybody. My name is uh, Marty Barron. I'm the executive editor of the Washington Post. Uh, and it is a real pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Uh, you know, you can consider yourselves all very special uh, because when the invitation went out for this event, it was sold out within a day. Um, and uh, ever since, uh, folks here at the Post have been telling people that it, it, there's no more room. And you can see that from the attendance here and the overflow crowd in the, in, in the next room as well. There is not a single seat left for anybody, and there are many, many people who would have liked to come. Uh, and it's no wonder that this is a, a sellout crowd as well, uh, and that this is a must-have ticket, because uh, you have an extraordinary panel here uh, today. Uh, individuals who uh, loom very large in history and in journalism and revelations about, uh, about the presidency. Uh, this defining moment in American history was also a defining moment uh, for American journalism and a defining moment uh, certainly for the Washington Post and a defining moment in its own way for people like me. Uh, now, not that I want to make anyone feel old, but I was in college when Nixon resigned uh, and the Post was breaking its Watergate stories. Uh, and it was that journalism that really helped inspire me to uh, get into the field, as it did with many others. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to introduce your wonderful moderator, Ruth Marcus. Uh, Ruth joined the Post in 1984 and is now one of our most distinguished columnists. She is known for doing the hard reporting before offering her opinions, but she has strong opinions too. And over the course of her career, she has covered every institution, uh, it seems, in Washington, from the Supreme Court to the White House to, to Congress to the Justice Department. And she's also, also deeply experienced on the campaign trail, has covered many campaigns of every type, and few know Washington as well as Ruth. So you couldn't help for a better journalist to moderate this panel. What and advice? uh, uh, -huh. <laughs> uh well, you certainly couldn't ask for a nicer person. So um, I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to turn it over to Ruth, uh, who will introduce the panel. And thank you again to everyone for coming. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Marty. Um, I, Marty talked about making people feel old, and I don't actually have a lot of opportunity to do that these days, so I would like to trump Marty by saying that I was going into my senior year of high school, and <laughs> very sorry guys, um, except for Ken, who we'll get to later, who I'm a little bit bitter about, um, on the night that Nixon resigned, and I have to say, not in my wildest dreams could I ever have imagined growing up to be able to be here moderating this panel tonight with this incredibly distinguished group of folks. So this is not just um, a privilege for me, uh, it's just an absolute hoot. Um, it's particularly a hoot since I think maybe somewhere in this audience um, are my two daughters who are the age that I was uh, when uh, President Nixon resigned, and I didn't even have to twist their arms to get them to come tonight. But let me just say, it wasn't to see their mother. <laughs> um, I'm going to start from that end, um, and actually probably do uh, Bob and Carl together, because they, in fact, are together in the public mind as Woodstein. Um, this is the <laughs> ultimate needs no introduction, introduction uh, in American journalism. Um, Bob and I, he probably doesn't remember this, we first met um, in 1981 when he told me I was very foolish to be heading off to law school and should just come to work for the Washington Post. Um, he was probably right then, but it all worked out just fine <laughs> in the end. Um, Bob's worked for the Post since 71. He teamed up with Carl, as everybody in the universe knows, to start reporting the Watergate story, which has been called, with no exaggeration, the single greatest reporting effort of all time. If there's one word to apply to Bob, it is indefatigable. Uh, most of us, having uh, reported the Watergate story, would have sat back and rested on our laurels. Um, Woodward apparently does not have laurels to rest on <laughs> because in addition to the two incredible pieces of work that he and Carl produced, all the president's men in the final days, please buy them out front. Um, there, he's written 14 other books that pierce everything, every institution in Washington from the Supreme Court, which I 
personally know how hard it is to pierce to Hollywood, to the Federal Reserve, to, of course, multiple presidencies. And if you just want to get a little bit depressed, he's written, uh, if you're me at least, he's written more number one national nonfiction bestsellers than any contemporary author. So there you go. Um, I'm going to leap over Ken for a moment because they really, they are literally separated here, but I think that's just to make them behave. Um, to, to introduce Carl, and I think um, only Woodward could make Carl Bernstein look like a slacker because if you look at, he has, um, while, while Woodward went after the Supreme Court, Carl decided to tackle such easy subjects as the Pope and Hillary Clinton, <laughs> two, two venerated but impenetrable institutions. Um, in addition, this, Carl, this is a story that you don't know. Um, in addition to writing a book about his parents uh, and experiences in the McCarthy era, many years ago, one of my colleagues came back from a trip to Garfinkel's, and she'd given her credit card to, an, uh, yes, Garfinkel's. Some of us in this audience remember it was a department store. <laughs> this um, colleague gave her credit card to a uh, woman behind the counter who said, oh, you work for the Washington Post. Perhaps she says, you know my son, Carl Bernstein? <laughs> 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 Proving that behind every successful journalist is a proud mom. Um, and she regularly waited on John Ehrlichman. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> who bought um, beam porcelain birds. Um, Carl has written for Vanity Fair, Time, USA Today, Rolling Stone, and The New Republic, in addition to being uh, an ABC correspondent. Um, and welcome to him. I'm now, it's so exciting to feel taller than somebody. Thank you for doing this, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Drew, what, whatever her actual physical height here, is a Washington institution. The Washington uh, journals that she wrote were really a citizen's guide to Watergate in Washington as the Nixon presidency were, was unraveling. And I have to tell you, though I read them at the time and I reread them some years later, I've been rereading them now and they really fit the goal that she had, which was to explain to people what was going on in a way that would be understandable and comprehensible and illustrative to them of what that time was about 40 years from now. And she captured the anxiety and really the insanity of that era. And the thing that's really remarkable about Elizabeth is she just never stops reporting. Her 14 books about Washington, Rivals, Bob. When I first started writing now many years ago about money and politics, um, she, her work was really the seminal work in that field. And we all owe her a debt of gratitude for her work. <laughs> Finally, Ken Hughes is a recovering journalist <laughs> and a researcher at the University of Virginia's Miller Center for Presidential Recordings. And really, a big shout out to the Miller Center for all the great work that they do. I'm a little bitter about Ken because um, he says that Nixon entered the White House the same year he entered kindergarten, <laughs> which if you do the math, which Ken kindly did for me, uh, means that when Nixon resigned, he was only 10 years old. So he says in his bio, he had a lot of questions about the scandal, the biggest being, how could this happen in America? Uh, Ken has added a really important um, chapter and uh, piece of history to that understanding. He's got a fascinating new book out called, also on sale out front, called Chasing Shadows, the Nixon Tapes, the Chenault Affair, and the Origins of Watergate. And he's going to tell us more about the origins of Watergate later. Um, but in the age of really easily accessible video, uh, we can't talk about Nixon 40 years later without taking the opportunity to go back in time and um, actually see the events of that evening. So if we could do that, that'd be great. Where is it? Never works. Oh, We're going to give the sound 10 seconds to work, and then we'll. 
Oh, there they are. <laughs> Wireless internet. We just lost the feed. Okay. You know what? I'm he gonna... never resigned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anybody can read lips, it's they can tell us what it's happened. It's all a trick. Um, <laughs> so, so without that traumatic moment, some of us remember it. Some of us have seen it on TV when the wireless speed did work. Um, I just, <laughs> I just want to um, take a very brief moment, very briefly, um, for for those who were immersed in the story at the time. Elizabeth, Carl, Bob, just give us very briefly what that particular night of his resignation felt like to you, Elizabeth. This is the night that he announced he was going the to resign. The night he announced he was resigning. He was going to resign, and it was the next day that was truly bizarre when he had a goodbye, farewell speech to his staff. Um, and it was pretty mawkish and kind of embarrassing, and he was reading from Teddy Roosevelt's memoirs. Uh, he associated with Teddy Roosevelt, the man in the arena, and he never gave up and this sort of thing. Um, and he... Teddy Roosevelt was this sickly boy who became this big, strong figure, and Nixon had been a sickly boy, and I knew the rest of you. Um, <laughs> he was talking, he read from Teddy Roosevelt about when, his, my, when, when my dear wife died, I mean, what that was about. It was very weird. Now, I learned in working on this uh, version of the book that at the same time that was going on, he had a military aide in there stealing papers that supposedly had signed over to the document, the archives, but he wanted to write his memoirs, uh, called RN, um, like TR, and so this guy was loading these documents into trucks and sending them out to San Clemente. They'd been doing it for a while, but then finally a Ford person caught them and, and uh, said, you can't keep doing that. So it was a very strange event, and then they went out to the helicopter, and who can forget that, you know, the iconic <laughs> scene of our era. Carl, the night of the resignation. Um, Bob and I were in the newsroom. Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Post, had come downstairs from her office. Ben Bradley, the editor of the paper. Uh, there were surprisingly few people in the newsroom uh, because we, we knew what was coming. Uh, and, and Catherine actually said uh, to the group of us, no gloating. And. Uh, <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> and, uh, and there was no need, because my feeling was one of absolute total awe that it had come to this, uh, that finally the country was, was going to be spared him in office, and also recognition of, of the fact that those in the room had had some real role in, in what was happening. But awe, total awe. And, and, and the fact that the system had worked. Bob? Uh, I was sitting on the floor of Howard Simon's office. He was the managing editor, uh, watching the speech. And uh, this was before the Bezos era. It was the Graham era. <laughs> and so they handed out sandwiches that night. And I know. <laughs> I remember the very bad bologna sandwich <laughs> that I was sitting there eating, and uh, not only did Catherine Graham issue the no gloating rule, but Ben Bradley did, and he was you know, kind of going around the newsroom slowly, not uh, showing any emotion, and Ben and I uh, went to the elevator because we were going to go down and get something to eat, and the elevator opens, and there's Sergeant Shriver, who has somehow broken into the post security <laughs> system. And it's, uh, Shriver being, it was head of the Peace Corps in the Kennedy era, uh, married to one of the Kennedys, very much uh, a Kennedy person. He sees Ben and he goes, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Blew and, the cover. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Ben is just kind of, you know, trying to pretend. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Shriver just wouldn't stop. And he just said, oh, I had to be here this night with you. <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, it, it kept, the, the moment was uh, one of, you know, what's happening here? What does it mean? And... That was 40 years ago, and to a certain extent, Carl and I have spent 
those 40 years, Elizabeth uh, II, you know, what was Watergate? What does it mean? What is its ultimate uh, impact? And uh, what's so fascinating is there are always more and more tapes that come out. In fact, I think that aren't there 800 hours of tapes that the Nixon Library is going to release uh, in a month or so? Is that right? Uh, there's there's about 800 that um, they have no plans to release, but. Well, we'll somebody we'll told me they're going to be available, and okay. you know, so we'll oh, be back so with the headphones. At, if they at, are, uh, at, at, the headphones there, never go away. There are always more tapes, and they never fail to astonish and revolt. Um, in there, uh, yeah. Elizabeth, did you want to say something about well, that? Well, but they don't fundamentally change the story. You can, Watergate is so complicated. I mean, there, it was about some big things, which I hope will be asked, but. You get very caught in the minutiae and realize that Nixon said, oh my God, did he say that? And did he talk to Billy Graham about the Jews controlling the networks? Yeah, he did. And it's not astonishing, really, of anything that comes out, but the basic outline of what it was about and what mattered hasn't changed. Nothing, I've seen nothing that says, oh, I see, you know, it was all different than what I thought. So we have so to be careful. That is the perfect segue um, to the way I'd like to structure this discussion. I believe it is an unwritten rule of moderating Watergate panels, that it is incumbent upon the moderator to channel the um, very well-known question from Howard Baker, what did he know and when did he know it? We see that mm. unearthed every time. I'm not going to um, raise that question, but I'm going to rewrite that question as a way of structuring our discussion. So I want to do it in two parts. What do we now know about Watergate and Nixon? and why does it matter that we know it. Um, and in that regard, I think um, I'll start with Bob and Carl. You guys can bicker about who goes first. You wrote a few years ago, and in the afterword to the book, the Watergate that we wrote about in the Washington Post, I have this type that says 1872 to 1974. I think it was 1972 it that long. to 1974. <laughs> um, it's, not the water, it's not Watergate as we know it today. It was only a glimpse into something far worse. By the time he was forced to resign, Nixon had turned his White House, to a remarkable extent, into a criminal enterprise. So talk about that a little bit and address the question, if you would, what do we now know that you most wished you had known back in the day and could have told people then? Well, I mean, real quickly, what, what's, what's interesting is Watergate started before the Watergate burglary. And that's uh, very important to understand. Uh, and when we did this piece and, and looked back at Watergate, uh, you, Watergate burglary was in June of 1972. In 1970, uh, Nixon authorized what was called the Houston Plan, which he had requested, which a top secret plan to expand wiretapping, break-ins, uh, mail openings, and uh, it was clearly illegal. Uh, in fact, in one of the tapes that is coming out in John Dean's new book, in 1973, Nixon's talking to his new chief of staff, uh, Al Haig, and he says, on the tape, he said, I authorized the Houston plan. It was to use any means available, including illegal means. And then Nixon, with kind of a, a sense of, uh, oh my God, what did I get into, says, no president of the United States can admit that. And so Watergate started uh, much before Watergate because it was a mindset of uh, doing anything to advance uh, Nixon's policies, his political stature, and uh, there was no barrier, including the law. The notion that the Nixon White House, and you hear it on the tapes, and I, and I use the term advisedly, was a criminal madhouse. Uh, and the more that we learn, the more it becomes apparent. And, and it goes to Nixon. It always goes to Nixon. Uh, never on those tapes. Do we hear Nixon say, uh, Bob calls it the, the, the dog that never barks, never do we hear Nixon say, what would be right for the country? 
about almost anything, not, not just what's happening. But what is happening is a whole presidency in which the focus is retribution on enemies real and imagined going back to the early 1950s. And that there is an assumption made that various institutions from the press to the Democratic Party to the anti-war movement are undermining the Nixon presidency and the prospects of re-election. And everything that we hear on the tapes is about somehow finding a way, usually illegal, through criminal means to thwart those other democratic processes and institutions. And you know, we thought early on, and we wrote by October 10th, 1972, that Watergate, the break-in, was just part of a massive campaign of political espionage and sabotage to undermine the very system of free elections in this country, to produce the nominee of the Democratic Party for the presidency through espionage and sabotage that would be the weakest opponent of Richard Nixon. And when we wrote that story, we thought, ah, now it makes sense. But now, after 40 years, it all makes much more sense about this huge criminal enterprise. And Ken, you have probably, we were talking about this earlier, you have probably spent more hours listening to more presidential tapes than any human being in America. <laughs> sure. Lucky you, um, because you've been immersed not just in Nixon tapes, but in LBJ tapes. What's your take, um, at leaving aside your 10-year-old um, self, on what we knew now, what we know now about Nixon that we didn't understand at at the moment of his resignation. Well, first off, I just want to talk about how honored and what a surreal experience it is for my former 10-year-old self to be sitting here between Woodward and Bernstein talking about Watergate with, with all of you. But that said, uh, in between then and now, I have listened to an awful lot of tapes. And I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned about Watergate from the tapes is that Nixon had little choice but to launch a cover-up. Once the Watergate burglars were arrested and the investigation went to G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, the so-called masterminds of that break-in, um, Nixon had to obstruct the investigation because an investigation of Hunt and Liddy's crimes would lead back to his own. Uh, the White House had hired Hunt and Liddy to be part of this secret, uh, illegal, unconstitutional, special investigations unit that Nixon ran out of the White House. Um, he had put it together, we now know, for illegal reasons. Uh, one, to uh, engineer a break-in at the Brookings Institution, the think tank not too far from here, uh, to, to gather uh, information about his enemies in the anti-war movement and the Democratic Party uh, through illegal processes, through the grand jury uh, investigations of the Pentagon Papers leak uh, and use that information illegally to destroy his critics. So people think, you know, well, it's, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. Uh, no, Nixon had too much uh, criminality to cover up before the Watergate break-in to really allow any sort of investigation to go forward. And, and why don't you just take a moment, actually, to tell us about the Chenault affair and the role that, what that was and the role that that played in the criminality that resulted in Watergate. Which is your new book. Right. Which is your new <laughs> book. <laughs> My new which book. Which I've already plugged. Available for sale outside. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the Chenault Affair uh, occurred during the closing days of the 1968 presidential campaign. A very, very close race between Richard Nixon and Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Uh, less than a week before Election Day, Lyndon Johnson ordered a halt to the bombing of North Vietnam. Uh, the public knew that in return for that, he would get the uh, peace talks to begin uh, involving the North Vietnamese and that the South Vietnamese would be permitted to take part in those. The public did not know that he had these two military conditions as well, which is that the, uh, which are that the North Vietnamese had to respect the demilitarized zone dividing Vietnam and refrain from shelling civilian populations in South Vietnam. 
the Chenault affair was the Nixon campaign's attempt, a successful one, to make sure that those peace talks didn't start before election day. Nixon feared correctly that the beginning of peace talks would help Hubert Humphrey and possibly ruin Nixon's last chance at the presidency. So uh, through a Republican fundraiser named Anna Chenault, uh, the Nixon campaign transmitted messages to Saigon saying, hold on, we're gonna win. Uh, we'll do better by you once we're elected. Uh, Lyndon Johnson found out about what Chenault was up to through a variety of reasons. The National Security Agency was intercepting cables from the South Vietnamese embassy to Saigon. The CIA had a bug in the president of South Vietnam's office. And uh, yes, once- Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> a few years ago, a, I'd give this- What a talk. surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it's I said so it if, a few years ago, people would go, you know, there'd be a few gasps, but now you know, we know. And Lyndon Johnson uh, put, had the FBI put a wiretap on the phone in the South Vietnamese embassy. November 2nd, three days before the 1968 election, Anna Chenault calls up the ambassador of South Vietnam and says, I've got a message from my boss, not further identified. Hold on, we're going to win. Um, so Johnson knows that the Republicans are interfering with his peace talks, but he doesn't have the goods on Nixon. He calls the Senate Minority Leader, Everett Dirksen, goes into a tirade, sort of implies that he does have the goods on Nixon. Uh, the next day he talks to Nixon, and Nixon kind of gives him evasive assurances that he would never do that. Um, and um, make a long story short, um, Nixon never really knew how much the federal government had collected with regard to the sabotage on the bombing hall. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, at his first meeting with Nixon following the 1968 election, uh, said to him, not only did we have a tap on the South Vietnamese embassy phone, we had a tap on Anna Chenault's phone, which Johnson had requested, but the FBI had not done, and we had a bug on your campaign plane for the last two weeks of the campaign. So Nixon, if, if that had been true, uh, then any interference that Nixon personally did with the peace talks would have been in the FBI file. So Nixon takes office obsessed with getting his hands on the bombing halt file. He has H.R. Haldeman uh, put aides to work on it. One of those aides is Tom Charles Houston. Houston uh, first says, you know, we've looked into the bombing halt and while it doesn't make Lyndon Johnson look good, it doesn't make us look very good either. And then Nixon comes, I'm sorry, Houston comes up with a very strange story in which he says that there is a complete bombing halt report with all the documents from the time at the Brookings Institution. And it was prepared by uh, Clark Clifford's Defense Department, uh, his top aides, Paul Warnke, Morton Halperin, and Leslie Gell. And this, this is exactly the sort of thing we need. Um, probably going way longer than I should. And if you want to know the rest, read this book. Okay. <laughs> there, that's fair. Uh, Elizabeth, you, uh, in one of your dispatches, wrote about a time in which the unfolding story, quote, began to take on the characteristics of a Russian novel. Someone we had never heard of suddenly emerged as an agent in activities that were almost inconceivable. Um, and that really resonated for me because I was always unable at the time to keep any of these characters straight. But of course, the main character was Richard Nixon and complex and impenetrable and not understandable, but you've done about as good a job as anyone of trying to understand the kind of tortured mind that led us to this national crisis and to look at Nixon's um, activities even post Watergate as a way <laughs> of understanding him. So tell us a little bit about Nixon and what impelled him to do these things from your point of view. Thank you. Um, there was some talk about <clears throat> when did Watergate begin. You might say it was born in this little town in Yorba Linda, California when he was born. Um, <laughs> now, I say this with some empathy. I think he was trapped in his own personality, in his own hang-ups, and his hang-ups is too light. But I don't do any psychobabble. This was a man who all his life 
felt that everybody else was getting a break and they all had more advantages than he did, and he had to show them that he was going to be, he went out for football, I mean, he couldn't run, he couldn't throw, he couldn't, but he was going to go out for football, he didn't care how much he got banged up, he was showing them. High school, he rebelled against the most, the uh, she-she, she-she, or the most important, distinct, uh, classy fraternity and started his own. Um, he was always resenting and feeling that others were having advantage over him, and he had to show them. And he was going to get even in some way. So it's not hard to see how this evolved when you get into the Oval Office and you have all of this machinery at your control. And by then, it wasn't just, he confused, he confused political opponents with enemies. His idea of foundation presidents or university presidents or newspaper publishers or anybody who wasn't for him was his, not his opponent, not his critic, his enemy. And he felt that you could use the instruments of government. This is what's so scary about it. <coughs> and, you know, watch presidential candidates or certain governors. You know, do they use the instruments of government carefully with boundaries? With these people, there were no boundaries. Nothing was, they said, somebody had testified that they put the Houston plan away, but they didn't. Somebody said, really never was put away. Um, the break-in of the Watergate was one of a series, but he, the cover-up had to happen because, as you say, things had happened before. They had broken into, this is the, the big one, the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg who leaked the Pentagon Papers. Now, they went berserk on the Pentagon Papers. That was also Henry Kissinger, who was very, very upset about it. He had ordered the study, okay? And these two people, Els, um, Les Gelb and Bort Halpert, had worked on the study. Their understanding was that two chapters were still sitting in the Brookings Institution. And you hear Nixon on a tape saying, God damn it, go in there and blow it up and get that safe. Um, and Firebomb the goddamn fire, place, he I, says. I want it done want to, on a fevery basis, yes. he says at one point. Go in and get the goddamn files. So they had sent one of these Russian characters, Anthony Lazowitz. He's one of my favorites, because he, <laughs> he was always doing something extremely stupid. Um, <laughs> and he tasted it. He said, yeah, they got files. And this and that. The thing almost happened. And there's a question whether they got stopped by a guard. Or, they had no files. They had no papers. They had nothing. But these things grew up in their minds, and they had to act on them. When the burglars were caught in the Watergate, what Haldeman and Nixon talked about when Nixon got back from Key Biscayne was, oh, there's all those other things they did. And they was really worried. Nixon was more worried, the way I read what they said and talked to people, about the um, break in Ellsberg psychiatrist's office. I mean, Nixon had standards. He knew. <laughs> that was such a blatant violation of a constitutional right, of the Fourth Amendment, of rights of privacy in your home and place. To go in and get somebody's psych psychiatric files. Well, once again, there were no files. I mean, the one thing that might have saved us all is the these burglars, the Cubans, the, the plumbers, they were stumble bums. They messed up everything they did. <laughs> That's how they got caught. They'd actually been in the Watergate office bill, <clears throat> as you two know, on um, Memorial Day weekend before then. They got in. But they put the tap on, you know, the phone wrong and the pictures were blurry. Um, <laughs> and they took it to John Dean, and John Dean was <clears throat> excuse me, John Mitchell, the chairman of the reelection committee, as opposed to supposed to have said, that's junk. I doubt that that's the word he used. Uh, go back in. Now, I don't know how stupid you have to be to go back in, put the tape up, the tape comes down, and you put it up again. But they, they actually tried four times, okay? <laughs> the first time they were going to give, they gave a dinner. They did a stage a banquet in the Watergate, so they were in the building. <laughs> and they got caught in an elevator, okay, for the night. <laughs> <laughs> then they got up there, and, oh, we don't have something to undo this lock. So, one of the Cubans went down to Miami to get the right thing to do the lock. Then they got in over Memorial. It was like the Marx Brothers go to a constitutional crisis. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, my real point is, it was a constitutional crisis. It was deadly serious. I mean, there was sort of a nervous hilarity while this was going on because you couldn't believe it. And what, what was going to happen next? And who were these characters? But it was whether a president will be held accountable to the courts to the Congress and really to the people. 
And they did everything they did, they could to not only avoid that, but to defy the other institutions. And the other part of it, which Carl talked about, was to interfere with the inner workings of the opposition party to try to maneuver who their nominee is going to be. And I exaggerate not when I wrote, this way lies fascism. These are bully boys. You know, it's not quite the Reichstag fire, but it's, you know, in that, in that area of morality. So it was a very scary, and um, still is, uh, the system worked but barely. There was a lot of cowardice that went on, but there was also a lot of greatness. Um, it was not clear, really, till the end. You can look back now and say, well, obviously he was going to get caught. It wasn't obvious at all. So I, I want to um, pick up from that point um, and imagine a kind of thought experiment of what if we had Richard Nixon today, oh, like what to. the Watergate story would have been like, how it would have unfolded, what course it would have been taken. And I want to do this in two stages, and I'm just going to throw it open to anybody who has thoughts about that. The first is, um, you guys might have noticed, in fact, the room that you're sitting in used to have presses. These used to be the presses. We literally, in the good old days, when had the newspapers hot, hot, literally hot off the presses from down here upstairs to the fifth floor newsroom. Um, times have changed. Journalism has changed. What would Watergate have looked like in an age of Twitter and the internet and 24-7 cable <coughs> news? Would it have simply evolved more quickly, or would it have evolved differently? You hear um, some of the folks who were here during the Watergate era talk about the good old days. It sounds pretty good to me when they couldn't wait to get to their um, end of their driveway to pick up their Washington Post in like the morning. To uh, pardon? You should make it sound like dinosaurs. We are like we are dinosaurs. <laughs> it's okay. Embrace we're the still brontosaurus. Here. The dinosaurs aren't. Um, um, to you know, embrace to to get the latest um, chapter in this unfolding story. Just talk for a minute, whoever wants to tackle this, what it might have been like if Watergate were happening today. Let me try one thing, and I, I don't believe that if history works, incidentally. At the same time, I think that there's an aspect of the journalistic part of this that, that gets ignored too often. Um, yes, we have Twitter, and yes, if this story were covered today, there, there would be a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. Uh, there would be, uh, you know, we had the advantage in this building of maybe the greatest editor of our time uh, and the support of maybe the greatest publisher of our time. And <clears throat> we were not, you know, out there alone. We had an institution that systemically uh, was brave, courageous, and conservative about what would go in the paper. And we had to be right. We made some mistakes, but we had to be right. And I think in today's atmosphere, you don't need Watergate to see how much information out there every day that gets on the evening news, that's on Twitter, that's, that we absorb all the time, is not right. But one of the things that's totally different today is that a consensus evolved in the country, in the political system, and we can talk about that more, uh, based on the best obtainable version of the truth, which is really what, what good reporting is. And the people of the country came around by reading and knowing the best obtainable version of the truth that Nixon was a criminal and had to go. Today, I suspect that those, if you look at who, why people are seeking out information, it's no longer predominantly for the best obtainable version of the truth. It's for partisan and ideological uh, ammunition to reinforce what they already believe, their political beliefs, their religious beliefs, their ideologies, so that we have to look at a different country where the citizens themselves are not open in the same way to the truth that they were at the time. 
Um, real quickly on, on that, obviously the internet environment is driven by impatience and speed, and when we were working on this story, Carl and I could work for two or three weeks on one story. Uh, we would write it on things some of you may remember, typewriters, <laughs> and uh, there would be paper that produced six copies, and the drafts would go to the editors. They would look at it. They would say, well, what about this? Or get more sources, work harder, dig into it. Uh, ben Bradley, uh, the ultimate editor, uh, uh, was a, a, a uh, Carl's right, one of the great, certainly probably the greatest editor uh, of the last century. But it wasn't just for what he would put in the paper, it's what he would keep out of the paper. And there was a kind of patience. And if, real quickly, uh, tell the story about Catherine Graham, who was the publisher and the owner. In January 73, after Carl and I had written, this series of stories that essentially said, uh, as Carl points out, is a uh, criminal enterprise in the Nixon White House. Uh, one of the problems we had, most people did not believe it. Uh, it was thought inconceivable that Nixon or the people had uh, conducted this espionage and sabotage operation, that there was all this illegal money. $700,000 in a, a safe in cash for uh, undercover activities at the time. That was lots of money. And, uh, it, and so Catherine uh, Graham invited me up for lunch one day. It was a day when Carl had to go to a funeral. And I remember walking in. Uh, she had supported the publication of these stories. We knew her a, a little bit. And uh, she when we sat down, she started asking me questions about Watergate and blew my mind with what she had followed and read. Uh, I, I think at one point she said she read something about Watergate in the Chicago Tribune, and I remember thinking, what's she reading the damn Chicago Tribune she for? <laughs> no one in Chicago <laughs> does. <laughs> uh, world's greatest newspaper. Uh, I read as a child. And uh, so she, she had absorbed all of this, and it was a kind of management style of mind on. She had intellectual control of what was going on, but hands off. She didn't tell us how to report the editors how to edit. And then at the end, she, like a great CEO, she had the killer question. She said, well, when is all the truth going to come out? When are we going to find out what really happened? Or when are we going to find out uh, that we got it right? And I said that Carl and I, uh, because it, there was an active cover-up going on, there was not a strong investigation, to say the least, by the federal government, that they were paying the Watergate burglars for their silence. Uh, and the answer uh, is never. And I remember looking across that luncheon table, and she had this expression on her face of uh, sorrow. And she said uh, the following, never, don't tell me never. I left the lunch a motivated employee. <laughs> let, let me add something but, there. But, but she was not, yeah. but she was not uh, just to, I'm sorry this is a long anecdote, but it captures the essence of what she was doing. And uh, what she said with that was, look, we are in the newspaper business. We are, if, if it is a moment of peril and we're not believed, and one of the secret strategies of the Nixon campaign was to challenge the very valuable FCC TV licenses that the Washington Post Company owned. But she, but she said, look, keep at it. This is the business we are in. And uh, I was 29 at the time. I remember walking out and thinking, wow, it's great to have a boss who understands the business we're in, is supportive of it, and it, it doesn't get wobbly when the pressure and the denunciations uh, were visited upon us as they were. Carl, 
quickly and then Elizabeth. No, no, the, the, he's made the point about what was at stake with the licenses, and, and there's another part of this I'll tell later on. Elizabeth, th these guys did a fantastic job of summoning the um, tenor of the times. You were, at the time, had the luxury of reporting on a, and observing on a weekly basis, which seems, you know, amazing now. No, I, and, uh, I want to, okay, but, what's your question? But, but nobody has actually really done the thought experiment that I asked you to do of, <laughs> of imagining in the age of, would, what, so in the age of Twitter, would this all have come kind of crashing down and nobody would have been able to be diligent enough to well, get it out, or what would have happened? I don't rule that out, Ruth. I think it would have been a mess, though, and I'm very glad we didn't have that. We had a sort of, now it seems like a stately pace, but then, you had the morning paper, you had the radio, you had an awful, did you hear? Did you hear? You won't believe this. They've lost two tapes. Wow, they erased 18 and a half minutes. I mean, there's something was always going on, but at least it wasn't being made excessive amount about. Um, I like when, it, well, I think it was Carl who said, but you know, the, the country came along. That didn't just happen. And there's a very under-reported, uh, underestimated chapter of this, which what happened there when the, uh, question went to the House of Representatives. It was a long, this is very important to understand, it was a long time before respectable people or anybody could think, impeachment? You don't impeach presidents. I mean, nobody had been impeached since Andrew Johnson after the Civil War, and then he wasn't convicted in the Senate. This was a really rare, frightening thing to talk about. Remove a president from office? You know, these People now, they're not talking about removing someone from office. It's a whole different thing, but they very much have cheapened and uh, undermined the rather very important constitutional concept. And it wasn't just about crimes. What the Constitution says is you can be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. And I have to tell you, that House Judiciary Committee, led by Peter Rodino, now he had just been elected, uh, sort of stat short, Italian girl from New Jersey, so immediately said he must be mobbed up, but he never was. <laughs> but, but as, was as a Jersey girl, I'm trying to decide whether I want to take offense to that <laughs> or not argue with the that premise. Was, no, no, that, that was White House stuff, you know, they, they put that junk out there. But he, what happened was this ordinary group of people in this Judiciary Committee, and they hired a uh, committee counsel. John Doerr, who's really one of the heroes of this period. He worked in the Eisenhower Justice Department, and then Bobby e. Kennedy was a civil rights hero. Nobody could question his fairness. And then another person named Francis O'Brien, who was 27 and was Rodino's administrative assistant. They had to decide, what do you do? Nobody knew how to do this. You know, there was a book by Raul Berger. I ran to the stores to read Raul Berger's book, but it didn't say, well, how do you impeach a president? Nobody knew. So what they said, look, for the country to accept it, they kept their eye on the ball. It cannot be, appear to be partisan, and it cannot appear to come from one wing or another wing. And they worked it out. They pushed the very far right members over that way and the very far left members over that way. Sorry, we're not going to have something about the Cambodia bombing because that's political question. And we're not going to impeach on a political question. And they took a long time. They had hearings. And that's what brought the country around. By the time that committee voted, people thought, yes, this is fair. And it came from the center of the committee. There were Southern Democrats. There were some Republicans who formed a coalition at the core, at the center of this committee. And if you listen to John Doerr, you knew this was no you know, lynch mob guy. It was very, very carefully done. There was an interesting communication that went on there, Ruth, which was, uh, Mr. O'Brien, who thought of everything at 27, said, I don't want, between the American people in this committee, I don't want cameras, you know, all the television cameras. I want the people to be able to see this committee. So he made the networks go outside the room and uh, open, build holes in the wall, open holes in the wall. They could put their cameras through. If anybody can go back and try to remember that, it was just us and you. And the country watching on television without these instruments and things in between, it had a very interesting effect. But you knew that they were serious. And when they voted that first article of impeachment on a Saturday night, and C-SPAN is running these now, it's fascinating. Very slow, very deliberate. Nobody was gloating, I assure you. 
Well, Peter and Dina, when they announced he went back and, you know, cried. I went out on the White House on the lawn of the Capitol and cried. I mean, it was such a dramatic thing. There was no, oh, we got him. But Article 2, this is important because you are, you're right, there was, you know, criminal enterprise. But they went over and above that and said the president is accountable for these things. You do not have to prove. Howard Baker's question was a minimizing question. He was trying to narrow the question. He was working with the White House, okay? I hate to disillusion you, but that's, that's the truth. And as long as if he says you have to prove the president knew, and when he knew it, you know, probably, we still don't know what he knew, but it doesn't matter. We know that this all happened under his aegis with people he hired, and he set a tone, and they had goals of destroying the enemy, and there were no boundaries, and that's how it happened, and this was drawn together, and the public accepted it. Dixon, so Dixon would have been impeached had they not found this little piece of tape later, which I thought was unfortunate. Let me pick up on that, uh, if I may, as follows. And that's about the Republicans and about the difference today and then. Uh, that is, oh, well. in fact, be my next question. Because, so you can just be the moderator. So, <laughs> so when I say the system worked and where it almost didn't work, as Elizabeth said, it, it, it intimated, is, is this idea that there had to be a smoking gun, uh, which was absurd. Uh, because Wait, the, the greater, that. pardon me? That was also because the Republicans well, didn't really want to have to vote well, on a trial. Early, they early had, on. They but, had, yeah. but no, let, 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 me, let me just go through what the Republicans did and how heroic, actually, uh, many who were Republicans were. First of all, the Senate Watergate Committee was created, and think of this today, was created by a 77 to nothing vote of the Senate. Imagine a 77 to nothing vote <laughs> in the Senate today for anything. Post office. A, post you office. couldn't get a post Name office it. for seven. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Then uh, you had a judge in the district, U.S. District Court, who had been appointed by a Republican president and was himself a Republican, Judge Sirica, who had been reading our stories and forced in his courtroom. Uh, from the Watergate burglars, their confession that they indeed, there was a cover-up going on, that they were being paid for their silence. And then you have uh, the Watergate committee um, in, in which Republicans, and she's right, that, uh, that Howard Baker originally was a kind of White House plant almost uh, on the committee, but as the evidence accumulated, he too was open, not mere ideology or party. He was open to the truth. And then when Nixon would not turn over his tapes and the Saturday Night Massacre occurred and he fired the, uh, he, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, or the well, Attorney General resigned and the Deputy Attorney General resigned uh, because they wouldn't carry out Nixon's orders uh, on, on the tapes he was trying to, withhold, the question eventually went to the Supreme Court of the United States. Nixon expected that Chief Justice Warren Burger, whom he had appointed, was going to save him. And yet, whatever reluctance Burger might have had, he also was intent that there be a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court that Nobody, including the President of the United States, was above the law. So, and then at the very end, when Nixon did not want to resign, a delegation of Republicans, this is after everything is known, and Nixon thinks that he might be able to survive and win in a Senate trial uh, where you needed two-thirds uh, of a vote of the Senate to convict, Barry Goldwater, the 1964 nominee of his party, uh, the great conservative, leaves a delegation of Republicans to the White House and sits down across from Nixon. And Nixon asks Barry Goldwater, how many votes do you think I have in the Senate? And uh, Goldwater looks at him and, and says, well, you don't have mine, uh, Mr. Maybe. President. <laughs> and, and, and it indicates very clearly he is going to lose. And that's when Nixon really realizes he cannot survive and will resign. So this is the ultimate thought experiment, right? It's not knowable, but that's never stopped us from uh, speculating before. What if we had Watergate today and an age of Daryl Issa and Ted Cruz instead of Barry Goldwater? Well, that with Newt Gingrich in 1996. 
And we've, but, we've, we've been there, and that was the stepping, that was when impeachment got cheapened you, and ruined. But, I like to just but that was a different, but, but just, impeachment cheapened and ruined whatever you think about President Clinton's activities and what level that they rose to. If we had a, a world in which there was Nixonian conduct, do you think that the political parties, whatever the opposition party is, um, could summon the statesmanship and outrage? Here's, what that the, here's the point. Happened. Peter Rodino made it possible for the Republicans to be statesmen by pushing aside political questions and de-partisanizing it. It didn't just happen. They had, he had to make a number of them, enough of them comfortable in voting for the Articles of Impeachment by narrowing them, keeping them uh, unarguably the case. And the big one was to say, you don't have to prove that he was in on that crime, he knew this or that. He is accountable. That was Article 2, which was the big one. But a lot of this, Carl, I agree with you, but this wasn't just valor on the part of the Republicans. A lot of, They didn't want to go through this trial. Nixon still had a base, 30, 35%, something in there. And they were very strong for him. You had the midterms coming up. There's always a midterm. And they were terrified, rightly so, because they, the Republicans just got washed out to sea. In that midterm, we had 70-something Watergate babies coming into the House as, as Democrats. So there was, you know, there was greatness and there was cowardice. It was all a mixture of you know, want, not wanting to really confront it. Just get him out of here. We want, a lot of Republicans talked to me that way as I kept my journal. It wasn't, I just talked to people all the time, and then you know, I divided up into sections, seasons, and periods. They wanted him out. They just wanted to be done with it. They hated it. It was a terrible, they'd go home, well, how are you going to vote? And his people would turn up. It was sort of not the Obamacare of their time, but it was, it was unpleasant. And they were scared, and they just wanted to get him out of there to save their own skins, I'm sorry to say. Bob, and I also want to encourage you to jump in, Ken, because um, this is not a knowable. The, the answer to this question isn't knowable, so you might as well just, just imagine with the rest of us. Uh, but uh, what's uh, central and unique to Watergate are the tapes. And uh, uh, Carl and I spent some time uh, looking at transcripts, listening to tapes, taking uh, the work that Ken Hughes did, uh, has done at the Miller Center. And, it, it, and what expelled Nixon from office, Carl's right, it was the Republicans, but they listened to those tapes and they heard the transcripts and there was, there was a kind of rage in Nixon. There, there was a sense of, uh, he said it in, an, in a very self-revealing moment the day he resigned that speech Elizabeth was talking about which was uh, very strange. I mean he was sweating, he had called all of his senior staff, cabinet officers and friends into the East Room uh, had his wife, uh, this was published, uh, or this was broadcast on live national television, and Nixon's closest friends were worried uh, that Nixon was going to be the first person to go stark raving mad and bonkers on live national television. I mean, he was just talking about his mother and his father, but at the end, in a moment of clarity, he kind of waved his hand like, this is why I called you here. And he said the following, he said, always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. And that's exactly what ha happened. The piston in the Nixon presidency is revealed, uh, particularly on the tapes, is hate. It, it, it is the driving force, and he realized at that moment he's leaving that the hate in hating others, he destroyed himself. And it is precisely what happened in, in this case. Ken, did you have anything? Talked about that, that later, too. Yeah. So I, I want to shift to the second half of whatever the motivation was, the Baker formulation which is why does what we now know about Watergate matter? And in other words, the question I want to think about is this. Is Watergate a matter, and when I say mere historical curiosity, it's you know, one of the central episodes of American history, or does it also tell us something 
about the political system going forward. And so, Carl and Bob, you guys wrote that Watergate was a brazen and daring assault led by Nixon himself against the heart of American democracy, the Constitution, our system of free elections, the rule of law. And so anybody in the panel can uh, take off on this. Do you see this as an event that's capable of repetition? Or was Nixon a one-off, a figure so bizarrely gifted and tragically flawed that we don't have to worry about his like again for some of the reasons of hatred and maybe tapes also, Bob, that you were referencing before? Well, the tapes are, are, you know, I hate to repeat, are so important. <laughs> uh, when I was doing uh, one of my books on President Obama, I went in to interview Obama uh, and brought two tape recorders because I didn't want to have an 18 and a half minute gap. <laughs> <laughs> and his press secretary said, oh, yeah, tapes, oh, you know, we know a lot about tapes. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I reminded them that if you go to the Nixon Library, they have a little doll's house mock-up of the Oval Office, and it, it says, press a button here, and a red light will go on everywhere there's a microphone. Press the red light, and the Oval Office lights up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> there were five, maybe six microphones on Nixon's desk. There were microphones in the chandeliers uh, uh, in the Oval Office. So I, I mentioned this to Obama, and Obama said, boy, I better get somebody to check those chandeliers. <laughs> but then he, he said, he uh, uh, turned to his press secretary, and he said, can you imagine if everything we said in here was taped? And my thought was, I hope so. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and if you, if you get you know, to the, this, uh, it's exactly the right question that Ruth is asking about you know, where does this fit in and uh, it clearly is unique what is when you, and Ken is the expert on the tapes, what always struck me is Nixon as Elizabeth said, uh, resenting anyone who had any privilege. Oh yeah, when the moment there's a, a tape which you gave us where uh, Nixon discovers that somebody in the, his White House is meeting with all the Ivy League presidents. He goes bonkers. He just says, what? They are, who's meeting with those Ivy League presidents? And then he goes into one of his rages and said, they will never again be in this White House. Never, never, never. And from there to the Jewish Ivy League presidents. Yeah, <laughs> so that's but, a little but, red, you know, redundant, right? right? Yeah, but, yeah, but, the Jews but, were let's, let's, let's take what, you, what you're asking about, about now, then. Uh, and, and as I said, I don't think we can know yeah. about if history. But what we do know is, one, that it was the accident of that break-in at the Watergate that enabled us to know what we know, and the second accident was the discovery of the tapes. Otherwise, forget about it. And what all of this shows is how we need to know about what happens in our government and our presidency. And if you want to go to today and look at Twitter-dominated news and look at uh, the 24-hour free-for-all. What is so apparent is we're not learning what's really going on, and it's particularly true of the presidency. Take a look at Bob's work uh, in Watergate, what, what, what happened here, our books, and continuing in Bob's other books about the presidency. If it hadn't been for those books, we wouldn't know much about the succeeding presidency. That's the truth. We would know very little about the truth of the succeeding presidencies. Uh, and I, I don't want to, I did a book on Hillary Clinton and discovered that, oh, to understand the Clinton presidency, you had to understand everything about her and her role. You didn't see that reflected in the coverage, really. And, 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 and I think just to pick up on this, that. Uh, to find out what's really going on takes time. That's right. It takes months or years. If you take Carl's book, uh, Woman in Charge, about 
Hillary Clinton. Uh, it is long, exhaustively reported, and if you read that book, as I have, it is, I mean, at the end, in the final chapter, you, uh, and, and, and this, uh, I'm sorry, he's my pal, I love him, but this is a wonderful book, and it is so relevant right now because I think Hillary Clinton is in the news every now and then. <laughs> really? And at the end of the book, you quote one of her associates who, who is a supporter who says, you know, I think about Hillary running and, and you know, Bill is the first, uh, whatever he would be, the first husband. And <laughs> this person says, I'm not sure I want the circus back in town. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a question everyone should ask, yeah, and uh, the Clintons, both of them, have very strong points, uh, but it gets mutilated by the news system we have. You don't get the details, and the point Carl makes in this book at the end, which is an incredibly balanced account, goes back into her childhood, her time in Arkansas, the difficulty <laughs> she has many times dealing with the truth in reality. But in, in the end, you make the point, which people should understand is we're now thinking about whether she uh, is going to run for president, whether she should be president. You say that Hillary, in a, in a way, is her own worst enemy because she's misrepresented herself, that she has it was so caught up in the politics of things, so caught up in the secrecy of things, that the better side of her, which is quite religious, am I right, Carl? Yeah. Is somebody who has a r really large heart and cares about these issues, has been masked by the way she presents herself. So we, if, if you look at that Lord, book, okay. you look at what's, pardon? <laughs> No, no, go, fin finish the point, but I just wanted to go back to a few Watergate points. Okay, well, but, that, but no, but that's the, this, this is, is Watergate. Watergate. <laughs> Th this is Watergate because Pardon us. <laughs> the question is, what, and, and what is the standard we're going to make our judgments on? Is it good information? Is it solid? Is it well reported? Is it balanced? Is it fair? But or you, is it a bunch of sound bites and a bunch of tweets? that um, in the aftermath of Nixon's experience, no sane president will ever, we will not have LBJ tapes, we will not have Nixon tapes, you know, people are scared to keep yeah. diaries, et cetera. So, but we have different will technology. We, but we have will reporting. We, will, we have, will, will we be able to know either in real time or after the fact what we were dealing with in And president? that's why we need, we need more reporting. in depth reporting. That's, that's it. Uh, if you go, I, I just was looking at something, you know, I hate to keep coming back to the, something the two of us, but I was looking at one of Bob's <laughs> books, uh, but, uh, 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 or Elizabeth's books, actually. And in fact, if you look at what Elizabeth has reported through these administrations, which is a very different take than the conventional wisdom of this town, read her New Yorker pieces, Read her pieces in the New York Review of Books, and you see that the conventional wisdom of this town is so far off the mark, so consumed by questions of who's in and who's out and minutia, as opposed to what the real story is. Uh, that's where, where I'm trying to go here is that, look, what Woodward and I, what other, let's take a look at, at one of the greatest pieces of reporting of all time, what the Boston Globe did on the Catholic Church and pedophiles. And Marty Barron, our editor here, yeah. was the editor That's right. of the That's right. Globe at the time. What, this is one of the greatest pieces of reporting of all time, and to penetrate the institution of the Catholic Church as, as well, and the secrecy of it. It's doable. That's the point. It is that we don't have enough editors, publishers, and I think there's plenty of great reporters out there, incidentally. But the reporting is getting lost, one, in, in this cacophony, uh, but also that 
it's not our priority enough anymore among the so-called serious news institutions, the cable networks, the, news, you know, the network news. You're down to a couple newspaper institutions in America that really are concerned about, about reporting. We've got some alternative sites and some alternative, you know, ProPublica, uh, other things. But, but you don't need tapes. It's great if you have the tapes, but this, this is sui generis, what we, what we learned, uh, and, and accidental. You need reporters, and you need to be asking the right questions and banging on the doors, and that's what, what this whole conversation is about. I agree that we need reporters, especially like these two. Uh, but I want to get back to Ruth's point. <laughs> could it happen again? Or yeah. could we do it today? 40 years ago, the system just barely worked. And it took heroic efforts from people like this and people on the Hill and people within the executive branch. And while it succeeded then to an extent, the tapes show that to another extent, Nixon was able to get away with a lot. Uh, the worst abuses of power that Nixon engaged in uh, had to do with foreign policy, uh, a field in which he was extremely well respected and is well respected to this day. We now know that he prolonged the Vietnam War because he knew he could not win it. And if Saigon fell before Election Day 1972, it would take his second term down with it. <laughs> and so he made a conscious decision. He was going to continue the war in order you know, to aid his own reelection campaign. And a an additional 25,000 American yes. soldiers died in the interim. They say no one died in Watergate. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true. But Watergate turns out actually to be one That's of Nixon's lesser Vietnamese offenses. Cambodian. So, but, and also, I uh, a little technological. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I, okay, maybe I, I mean, misphrased that, 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 that a little bit. No, these foreign policy issues are debatable, as you know, and, and, and there's some well, evidence on the tapes, you're, you're quite right, but to say his uh, crimes were, and his significant crimes were in foreign policy, I think is it, that, look, this was an assault on the Constitution. This was, uh, go to the tapes again, Nixon, sits there and says, well, we'll do this, we'll break in here, uh, we'll get the IRS on, I mean, not just random citizens, but the, the Democrats, the big Democratic contributors. He said, I want, on that, he got the Secret Service to bug the telephone of his renegade brother. Now, I th you could have argued uh, for some time that uh, to be president, you had to have a renegade brother. <laughs> Uh, that's no longer the case. No, you but got a half uh, brother out there somewhere. Right yes, now. yes, that's right. Yes, running that's, around that's pretty good. good. But <laughs> okay, but the, the moderator is say I shut up. Cut everybody off for one second. I'm cutting you off for a very good reason, which is to try to get in some audience questions. So we have some microphones in the room. If you would raise your hand and wait for the microphone, I'm going to try to go this way. So I'm going to go all the way to the woman in the pinkish sweater over there with your hand up. Thank you. I think in all the president's men, there's a line, follow the money or something like that. The camp campaign finance laws or lack of them. I was wondering if you could comment about then versus now. I think yeah. Elizabeth Drew is um, possibly the best positioned person in America to answer your question. Actually, the best person sitting right in front of me in the front row. Would you like to answer it? Uh, yes, Watergate brought to a head the issue, uh, the idea that there's big globs of money floating around and people like Howard Hughes, you know, could write big checks or give them a suitcase of hundred dollar bills and his, but then they were the, they didn't match and it was all very strange. Uh, and after that, a good campaign finance bill was passed. I believe it was limited contributions, it limited spending. I have this to shock you with. The Supreme Court in the major decision on that, Buckley v. Vallejo, did not say money equals speech. They did not. And you now have these Supreme Court decisions since then based on this mythical 
sense of what they said, and they didn't. That serves the purposes of people who want to get the regulations off. So what Buckley Vallejo said is you can't put limits on what people want to spend on their campaigns. Is that true? Um, but now what you have is the Supreme Court determined to, then we had McCain find, oh, it was a pretty good law. I mean, McCain understood it then. This was a different McCain. Uh, <laughs> and he understood it, and those of us very involved in campaign finance understood it. We call it rolling reform, of course. If you put these regulations, somebody's going to figure a way around it. But if, you know, if you're so serious about it, then you plug that and you move on. Um, but it's really very broken down now. I mean, there still are limits on individual contributions, but not really. I mean, uh, Citizens United and an associated uh, decision, and then one last year, <coughs> name of, anyway. They've really deconstructed it. If you look at what, uh, what happened is when Sandra Day O'Connor retired from the Supreme Court and Alito took her place, everything changed. And they were undoing their previous decisions on a lot of things, including campaign finance reform. So they had upheld uh, McCain, Feingold, and two years later they unupheld it. So you've got a political thing going on too. I don't think there's a great now money has gotten so big and so important, I don't think there will be a great move in Congress to re-regulate this. They've all gotten dependent on the system as it is. Good, that, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, let's try to get in another question. Uh, the gentleman in the blue um, right there. Then I'm going to go to, towards the back of the room so I don't, because I don't want to disenfranchise you guys. To Mr. Bernstein and Mr. Woodward, um, I was impressed tonight that the, um, uh, of the, the far-reaching implications of this. I didn't think that it went back that far, but is there something that Nixon could have done that would have stopped this whole thing besides... Um... No, because again, go back to what Ken was talking to a moment ago. We wrote about him undermining the free electoral system through political espionage and sabotage. And what Ken is talking about is before he was even president, he was doing the same thing. That's, th this is about a mindset, as Elizabeth ha has pointed out. One of the things that uh, it, it, it has always interested, we keep coming back to Nixon's hatred. And if you read the final days about his last uh, year in office that we wrote, you'll find that it's a very empathic book. It's a human story on many levels and about what Nixon is suffering as this is all closing in on him. And when I hear the tapes, it's just a little historic asterisk. I'm always hearing Nixon go back to Hiss, to Alger Hiss and the Hiss case. Those goddamn Jews, those goddamn liberals, they've hated me since the Hiss case. And what Nixon knew that most of the rest of us didn't was that he was right about Hiss, that Hiss was a spy. We know it now from Venona, from the cryptography and all kinds of other things. But he, his, he felt maligned now. This is not to excuse anything, but it's just an interesting thing. Comes up, how many times does he talk about Hiss? Talks about Hiss all the time. And he thought, talks about it in the context that, that you're mentioning. He thought that his case confirmed what he thought about Jews and intellectuals and Ivy Leaguers <laughs> and, and leftists. His wasn't Jewish. No. But his wasn't uh, Jewish, but some of his He was establishment. He was worse. That's <laughs> <laughs> and Nixon I, thought I, that Nick, Nixon, Nixon said, his might have been half a Jew. Okay. <laughs> did he say he that? He did, yeah. Let's try to um, go to the gentleman in the white shirt right in front of the cameras there. Thank you. I want a question for Ken, who I think is somewhat underutilized tonight having listened to all these tapes, do you think the fact that no president will ever, ever record things like that hurts our perspective on the past because we're unable to fully understand how certain things come into being as a president, how they make decisions, and who really is saying one thing on Meet the Press or on CNN or on Fox News, but in a closed room, maybe saying something very different because that's what they really want to get accomplished but they can't say it publicly. Uh, my motto is tape them all. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, certainly listening to the Nixon tapes has been a 
perspective expanding experience for me because for once in history, we have this time machine that allows us to be in the past with the president as he is making these very fateful decisions for himself and the nation and the world. And uh, the lack of that troubles me. On the other hand, I would like to point out that all of us are carrying in our pockets, or most of us are carrying in our pockets, more sophisticated recording systems than, excuse me, <laughs> the one I just broke, no, um, <laughs> than, the, than the one that Nixon had in the White House. So I used to be able to say with confidence, after Nixon, nobody would tape. But you know, there, the technology has gotten to the point where a certain amount of taping might take place uh, without our full knowledge of it. So there, there might one day be employment for somebody like me in regard to another you know, I, administration. I would, I'm, I'm going to make one fairly short point on your question, which I think is a terrific question, which is <clears throat> the tapes that I actually find more interesting in some sense than the Nixon tapes are the LBJ tapes. Because in the LBJ tapes, you don't see a terrible, corrupt, tortured mind railing about people and failing to think about the good of the country. You actually see a president being a president, using the levers of power, and that is the sort of thing that I think we really will, you know, report. I'm a, as big a believer in reporting, though not as good a reporter um, as Bob and Carl, but that's the thing that we will really miss from not having that again. Let's get another question. Um, yes, ma'am, right here in the black. Lady in black instead of man in black, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, I, whenever I think of Watergate, I also think of what happened with Snowden and his revelations. So I was just wondering if you would comment on uh, the, I mean, I realize he's not a reporter, but comment on what has happened in government, what do we expect, and why are some of us not shocked that something like that has happened? Well, one, you're not shocked because we've known and it has been reported for years that an awful lot of this has been going no, on. Out, no there's, been, uh, there, there's been there's been too much shock uh, and and a lot of things taken out of context uh, and it, it, over, over this whole uh, debate about well, is he a hero or or is he a traitor uh, or all all the rest? What it seems to me that what we have and Look, terrorism has changed our world. And it is a real threat, and, and to pretend otherwise is nonsense. It's more of a threat than nation states are in, in many respects, or most respects. Uh, it's the new method of warfare, and it affects us all. And so obviously we're gonna use, as we have in the past, these capabilities that we have uh, because it's the most basic tool of learning, uh, of getting intelligence. There are two ways, signals intelligence, human intelligence. Well, this is the, the signals part, and we're going to do everything we can. What we have learned is that, and, and Bill Sapphire, many years ago in the New York Times, was the first to say, we're heading in a direction where privacy is over, uh, where this huge capacity of the government to eavesdrop is, uh, is, is becoming more and more pro problematic. So we've got a conflict of civil liberties uh, and the necessary uh, protection of, of the country and, and, and ourselves. But, but it, Snowden is, uh, it, it informs people of, uh, in detail in a way that clearly we did not that's know. Right and the massive nature of it, and I think particularly our paper, the, the Post, has been quite responsible and aggressive in presenting that information. Uh, there are no grand juries, or to my knowledge, there is uh, apparently no crime. This is a, a policy discussion which is going on, which is going to go on for a long time, and President Obama himself has said, it's good we're having this policy discussion. So I think this is about informing the public in a very important way. It is not the criminality of Watergate, it is, at least based on what we know now. Also, Elizabeth, Snowden, wait, let me just on add on one, one, just, one quick okay. thing here, and that, and that is that what Snowden has really done 
is shown how insufficient the oversight of this is in the courts that have been established to look at, at this kind of intelligence gathering and the Congress of the United States. And in that, he's performed a great service. Elizabeth? Uh, Carl, you said something that pulls together the question that Ruth keeps asking us and we keep not answering. Uh, I'm a failure as a No, moderator. no, because I think context is everything. So, yes, Carl has been dragging me kind of crazy, too. We knew about this meta-gathering of, what, of uh, phone calls in 2006, revealed by USA Today. But why didn't it cause a big fuss then? Well, George Bush was president. You had midterms coming up. You had the wars still going on in Iraq. People were afraid. They didn't really want to, you know, uh, Karl Rove was ordering up these ads showing Max Cleland, a three-part three amputee out of Vietnam, showing him his picture next to uh, Saddam Hussein, not to uh, bin Laden or Saddam Hussein, he was defeated. These people were playing tough and people just didn't feel they wanted to go at it then. So Snowden does it later and oh, shock, horror, but it, it had really been there, there was more detail. This is why we can't answer your question, Ruth, because context is everything. When this was going on, a great mentor of mine and helped me think about, he said, the next time this happens, it won't be people like this, they'll be very, cool crew cut, not uh, crew cut, but they'll be very uh, Ivy League looking, very respectable. They won't be these kinds of thugs uh, that we were seeing. It will be different. Uh, I'm not as discouraged, as uh, marvelous as your books are, both of you guys. We can't wait for them. I think with Hillary Clinton, for example, I mean, Carl did a, a great book, but um, People sort of got onto her in 2008. I mean, you know, you, you, people pick it up. They smell things, and it's happening now. So um, you can't always get at everything, but you, there's a lot of stuff that gets out into the atmosphere, and if it's defined in a responsible way, which a lot isn't, uh, that's my that's my problem with all this. Um, it's there, so I'm not as um, I mean, we need their books, but we also can't wait for them all the time. No, I think there's a really interesting parallel between um, the, uh, the USA Today report um, and Snowden and the tapes issue, which is um, because I was confused when the Snowden report first came out because I thought we did know this. Um, but I think it's the actuality of it, the documentary evidence of it, documents. the unassailability of it that's very much like Nixon and the tapes. That, that sort of transformed and propelled that story. And also additional information and sco information about scope that came out. Let's, let's move on to another question, sir, uh, in the vest back there. Thanks. I just wanted to know, uh, oh. I just to know uh, if uh, anyone on the panel has any thoughts about whether uh, the abuse there is abuse of a constitutional authority that is involved in every presidency. No, no. And there are also matters of degree. At some point, we kept dealing with this with Nixon as things unfolded. There are matters of degree that become substantive matters. There could be this thing and that thing, but it doesn't make up for this grand assault on the Constitution or across the board uh, manipulation of government agencies to suit the agenda of the president and how he wanted to get reelected or those who he wanted to get the goods on. He would say, we're going to destroy, let's destroy Ellsberg. I want to destroy this or that. No, we're not going to have anything like that. Um, so there are differences of degree that are substantive difference that make all the difference. And that's where the judgment calls have to be made. What we've been hearing about impeachment, we heard about with Bill Clinton, what we're hearing, these are not of the gravity, of the uh, breadth, depth of what went on there. They're not close. And that's what's so tragic, I think, about this cheapening of the idea of impeachment. But, but what, uh, I, th I think one of the questions embedded in this is what should we be worried about? Uh, and uh, my answer is uh, secret government that there is an incredible concentration of power in the presidency now. I, I think you could argue that uh, President Obama has more power than 
uh, the most recent presidents, the ones uh, that preceded him, or at least four or five of them. And uh, that power, as Carl pointed out, I mean, look at this century. 9-11 uh, has defined this century in many ways. And the power, uh, the secret power uh, that the intelligence community has is vast, overwhelming, and we need to know what's going on. And the people with, with uh, really good intentions and good faith can do things that make absolutely no sense and uh, so it needs to be watched. And the, the point that Carl and I are making and, and Elizabeth and Ken is what's the mechanism to find out? And the mechanism we have is the media. And if we are caught up in this, I mean, t talk to a reporter who covers the White House, any of a number of them I've talked to, and they say, uh, they file a story and then they have to do two blogs and nine tweets, and uh, they never understand anything. And they acknowledge that because they're on to the next. And you have got uh, these message managers in, in the Congress and in the White House, you call the White House and ask them about something, and if they don't like the questions, they'll say, why is that a story? And they can stop the press. And so uh, what we need to do is reconfigure ourselves to make sure that we, have, uh, that we are devoted to get to the bottom of things. Because if we don't get to the bottom of things, there are going to be things uh, from Nixon, which is certainly the most serious case, to things that people are uneasy and uncomfortable about, to say the least, uh, the NSA programs that we've written about. Oh, there's so many people chomping at the bit here. Uh, uh, sir, right here. Seems one of the legacies of Watergate was to create this idea of a scandal, which all other scandals would be measured in the years to come, with a gate following as a suffix on that scandal. And you talk about um, the need for great reporting, which the two of you did, the the idea of getting to the root of government abuse of power. And I look at the stories of today and wonder why there aren't people like the two of you reporting on the IRS abuse of power, this lowest learner uh, idea of losing emails today in an age of servers and backups. Why isn't somebody at the Post doing something like you guys did back then to see why we don't have that kind of cover-up? And if there isn't a cover-up, let's find out why not. Uh, I don't quite buy that there isn't a lot of great reporting going on out there. Uh, and there was early on, there was some very good reporting on the IRS uh, that, that about the Cincinnati office, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I agree with you, we need more reporting uh, on, on what's happened at the IRS. I think also we need, in this case, a real congressional investigation, a bipartisan investigation instead of a witch hunt like Daryl Issa uh, is, is, conduct, is conducting. Uh, but uh, I think the reporting is happening. We, I have a feeling somewhat from our discussion that we're in a hermetically sealed chamber here. And that, that, that we're looking at the political system, we're looking at journalism, divorced from the rest of the culture. And neither is divorced from the rest of the culture. We have all kinds of problems in the culture about people telling the truth. We have all kinds, uh, institutionally, we have all kinds of problems uh, that uh, people are not interested in the truth, that they've become, as I said earlier, wrapped up in, the, in this ideological debate about, about so much. I, all I'm trying to get at is that, uh, and the reporting that Bob and, and everybody up here is talking about, it's not just about the political system that we need, need it on. I go to the example of, of, uh, of what the Boston Globe did. Uh, you know, people 
in the culture today, the way we look at the disintegration of the Congress of the United States and the lack of truth-telling by members of Congress, you can apply that to many institutions in, in this country. And all I'm trying to get at is that, that this is all part of a larger texture that's not just about the political system and it's not just about, quote, political journalism. And we, need it in, we need it in business. We need it looking at sports. We need, you know, we need to find out what's going on about all of these things, and we also still have this problem about all of these things, about a, an audience that is less interested in the So truth. Elizabeth has something that she really wants to say, but I actually also really want to respond to your question because um, I, I think having done a lot of reporting about the, even though I'm a columnist with opinions about the IRS matter, um, I do have an opinion about that also, which is it's a very serious question about misuse of the IRS and suggestions that political groups were being targeted because of their politics are very serious and legitimate questions. But my knowledge of the factual development so far suggests absolutely nothing that is comparable in any way to the abuses that Nixon has engaged in. And so I think there is a, a real flaw um, in, in our kind of understanding and the instinct to, as you say, the gatization of every scandal. Because I don't think um, there is a learner gate, whatever the ultimate facts turn out to be, that, is go that history will, I, I feel fairly confident that history will not tell us that there was an Obama administration drive to target political opponents that is in any way comparable to what Nixon did, but, but and, Ruth, and, I, and I may I may end up being proved wrong. Ah, but um, I was going to make yeah. that point. That I was going <laughs> to end up being proved wrong. Thank you, thank and, you, and Bob. I is, guess I should have just okay, practiced you've law. You've got a, 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 a <laughs> point of view, and I, and it's indeed a, a reasonable one. And I know you're terrific at digging things out. But if Carl and I were 29 years old, we'd be on our knees to the editor saying, let us go to Cincinnati for two weeks. And the editor would say to Carl, just don't rent a car and leave it in a parking lot. And, and I'm all Which for he two, did. I'm just, and I'm all for two weeks. I'm not arguing against um, reporting first and um, coming up with the opinion later. That's sort of what I believe. So I'm all for sending you to, see. you can have three weeks in Cincinnati as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just sort of giving you my best assessment of the evidence so far. So based what on would the you do? I've You're done. our assignment editor. <laughs> We've got Elizabeth, Carl, Ken no. Hughes, and I as well, a team Bob, of four. we already know. We already know. I, what, what is it? Let me, I did some of the reporting. Well, let me, because I have. <laughs> now, You're going to wreck it. Only, only part do I know. But. I got to somebody who has been in the IRS for a long time, I'm from Cincinnati. Who, who has begun to, <laughs> who has be, begun to explain some of this to me. And I, but there is hey. more to the story, and you're absolutely right. We need more reporting. But thus far, uh, it, it, the facts, at least as far as I could find out, talking to a few people, including that there is no evidence whatsoever, as, as Ruth suggests, that this goes to the heart of the Obama administration or yeah. presidency. But there is a question of, of whether in that Cincinnati office uh, some, some things were interpreted as, as a license. And at the same time, it, it would appear that the New York Times did a hell of a good story on this, that the whole question of investigating political groups so they can get a tax exemption is at the heart of this. Uh, maybe you can talk Carl, about that some. Yeah, go I ahead. I can talk you, about this till the ahead. end of time, but I'm going to let Elizabeth Number talk. one, they all got the tax exemption, okay? Nobody was denied it. That's the scandal. There were some that she's, <laughs> that's what the, she's right. Right. Including, including democratic groups. Exactly. Here is the point. It's true. Yeah. If you but reported it all that week, there was one week there where we had Benghazi, we had the IRS, and we had, do you remember the, a, uh, the Justice Department was going after the AP, and this was the end of the freedom of the press. 
and it was all one week. Now, on this gate business, Bill Sapphire was very clever. He started this business of putting gate at the end of everything in order to diminish Watergate. They all do it, it's all the same. And it was, you know, anybody who does this now, I, I won't shoot you, but I will be very unhappy with you. <laughs> You're just falling for this trick that he did. And it diminishes the horror, the majesty, the importance of what Watergate was. And that was exactly what Bill was after. Now, if you looked for a minute that week, if you talked to people at all, you knew that they were also doing this to Democrat liberal groups. I know people who went out of business because they couldn't get their tax exemption in time. Why did it not make sense? You suddenly had all these groups, and you, know, you enter some code words because that's how you're gonna find them. Nobody was denied their tax exemption. What's going on on the Hill is they're trying to really weaken the IRS, and they've done so. So there's a question of proportion here. This is a highly uh, shocking thing to say. I think one problem with Watergate is we're so scandal prone. Everything, if it's not a scandal, it's not interesting. I think the fact that we went down the path of, uh, of not spending, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, asceticism, what the word is. Anyway, that's a, that's a very big thing that's happened to our politics, happened to our country, uh, and it took for a little while to say, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. I still haven't come up with the word, but. Uh, this happens to me all the time. So, but the, the point is, scandals is something, but there's an awful lot about governing and what goes on on the Hill and what goes on. That's not going to be a scandal, but it's terribly, terribly important. And if we should sort of not get in the fire engines but, quite know, so it, quickly. It's really interesting because I would posit that one of the corrosive legacies of Nixon was that for very good reason, he instilled in many of us a capacity to believe the absolute worst about our leaders. He had done yeah, so he many truly evil, corrupt, terrible things that we really imagine that a Democratic president, a Republican president, a president of any sort capable of, because we saw it, it happened. And it's not that we shouldn't um, be very suspicious when um, when suspicious things occur, and it's not that we shouldn't spend as many weeks in Cincinnati as we need to, but we've we've lost the capacity to believe in the fundamental well decency and politicians might not be the right words to put together, but <laughs> but that they're not all entirely completely corrupt. They're all Nixon. They've all kind of descended to Nixonian levels in our minds. Yeah. So your assignment for the four of us would be to go out and find some decency. I found no, it. decency in, does not in American sell, and I'm politics. all about getting Marty as yeah, many yeah, page could, views as he okay, can get. Okay, could, I, could um, I just tell a real live sell. anecdote? You can which, tell a real live anecdote. Uh, and uh, because I, I think we're, we're getting the, uh, a little uh, off track and, and we're kind of thinking, yeah, will we get to the bottom of these things and we understand them or we can do a little reporting and this was um, 30 days after Nixon resigned. Ford, Gerald Ford was president. It was September 1974. Some of you may recall he went on television early on a Sunday morning announcing he was giving Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. Now, he went on television early on a Sunday morning hoping no one would notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was noticed but not by me, I was asleep. And Carl called me up and said, have you heard? And I said, no, I was asleep. And uh, Carl, who then and still has the ability to uh, say what occurred in the fewest words in, with the most drama, <laughs> said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> Happy to report, I figured it out. <laughs> and we thought from that moment on, ha, ah, it, the pardon is the final perfect corruption of Watergate. That the guy, Nixon, who instigated it all, gets a pardon, 40 people go to jail. And uh, if, if you look at the history of this in 76, Ford lost to Carter 
perhaps because of the pardon and the suspicion about it. 25 years later, uh, I undertook one of the book projects, Shadow, about the legacy of Watergate uh, in the presidencies of Ford through Clinton and called Ford up, who I'd never met, never interviewed, and said, I want to talk to you about the pardon. And he, he said, fine. And I interviewed him six or seven times in New York, his home in Colorado, his main home in Rancho Mirage. I had two assistants, I have the luxury of time. Well, what happened? Why did you pardon Richard Nixon? And I kept asking him that. And it was only in the sixth or seventh interview in his home, I said, you know, why would you pardon Nixon? He said, you keep asking the same question. And I said, I don't think you've answered it. And then he said, okay, I'll tell you. Now, these are the moments you live for in journalism. <laughs> and he said, what happened? And this, uh, uh, he said, Al Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff, came to me and offered a deal. And uh, it would have been illegal if I'd said, I'll accept the deal. He said, I, in fact, rejected the deal because what Haig said, if uh, Nixon resigns, uh, you get the presidency, and uh, Nixon needs to know he's going to be pardoned. And, and Ford convincingly said, look, I rejected that deal. I pardon Nixon, not for Nixon, not for myself, but for the good of the country. And then he laid out his reasoning, which was very compelling, I thought. And he said, look, I had a letter from the Watergate prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, saying Nixon is a private citizen, now he's going to be investigated, certainly will be indicted, tried, probably convicted, go to jail. So Ford said, we'll have two or three more years of Watergate. The economy was in trouble. The Cold War was still on. He said the country could not stand it. And he said, very plaintively, he said, I needed my own presidency. And convinced me, and I think convinced Absolutely. Carl and many people Great that this was act. an act of courage. Great courage. Rather than the final corruption of Watergate. Yeah, now, looking at that 25 years later, it makes you real humble. And it make, and it, in fact, it, to a certain extent, it's humiliating that we were so sure in 76 what it was and then it's subjected to a neutral in-depth inquiry 25 years after the fact and what looks like that looks exactly the opposite. I, don't know, I believed him at the time. It made a lot of sense. That would have been the story for the next couple of years. He wouldn't have been able to govern and as he said this year, the X years of Watergate is enough. We were tired. The country was tired of it and we had to move on. I thought it was a wise decision then. But what one could imagine you um, being forgiven a, a little bit of paranoia, uh, you know, after what, and not paranoia, but suspicion and, uh, and, and questioning after what you had seen and after what, what he had done. You knew what presidents, you knew what Nixon was capable of, and you knew what presidents were capable of. So, um, but I'm glad we kind of came to well, agreement we on decency. Well, we were just looking for the decency. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now you're just going to make fun of me till the end of time. Um, right here in the red. Uh, given all that we have talked about tonight, uh, about Nixon, and having been old enough to live through working for Kennedy's election and Pat Brown's re-election against Nixon, why did Nixon get more or less not just pardoned, but forgiven to the point that all the ex-presidents went to his funeral and Absolutely. we don't You're treat him. I, mean, I know that the Republicans <laughs> want to do that, but why do we forgive him? I thank you very much. Ruth mentioned this earlier, and I didn't get to it, that after his presidency, I, I added a 10,000-word section to my journals of the time. I wrote it this winter about... Nixon had, you got to give the guy credit. How, how low could you have been brought, you know? And again, he was not going to, he was going to come back and he was going to show him. And he was out at San Clemente and they drew a plan called the Wizard Plan. And that whole section shows how he slowly, 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 he would have adored his funeral, but it was what he was looking for. <laughs> He, he set himself out to be respected again and to be considered a statesman. 
Now this didn't, you know. But it didn't but work, it didn't work, Elizabeth. It's not true. It worked in his terms. It worked. He got accepted by the establishment in New York. He got five presidents to his funeral. It worked in terms of what he wanted. Of course not. But what he wanted, he got presidents. He made presidents ask him about foreign policy. He got himself invited to the state dinner for the Chinese. Carter, every person he didn't want there, but Dixon got the Chinese. He was on the cover of Time and Newsweek. Publishers, excuse me, including some that you've been extolling, he came down and spoke to the publishers and editors, and he gave this wrong thing about predicting politics. He was dead wrong, and they gave him standing ovations. <laughs> there was a period in which people wanted to sort of say, okay, you know, we beat up on him enough, and he worked assiduously at it. He blackmailed Clinton into c consulting. It was a very, very careful plan, and actually, for what he wanted, it was a success. Now, do we all love him now? No, that wasn't the point, but that's, that's the answer to your question. It's, no, 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 but no, what's history's the judgment? History is a, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Look, the Fifth War Watergate, after the press, the nice. Ellsbergs, the justice system, uh, the Democrats, the political enemies, was a war against history. And Nixon conducted it assiduously, as you're indicating, but he didn't win. We wouldn't be here today having this. Ken wouldn't have written the book that he wrote. Uh, that, that in fact, look, there is always going to be in, in a huge uh, body of people, uh, some who are going to believe what they want to believe. But, I answered the gentleman's but, question, but, Carl, excuse me. You're talking about entirely different things. No, he said, I'm, why did people accept him? They did because he worked at it. You're right. If everybody drops it, oh, he's a swell guy. But, no, we weren't no, going to do that. that. But no, my, my, my point he, is he that the judgment it, he that he did but, not succeed. That yes, there were momentary. There have been momentary uh, periods in which some people thought maybe he's rehabilitated a bit. He was accorded some respect. Uh, there's a debate about him, and yet the overwhelming, totally overwhelming judgment, oh. again partly because of the tapes, is of his criminality. And the criminality I'm not of his have, We have just a few I'm not arguing left. that, Carl. I wanted to, he um, succeeded in his plan. And, you know, he got, he was on the cover of the magazines, got awards, the most popular man in America. And, and here we are talking about yeah. him, which probably, in, in ways that probably aren't making him all but, that happy, let, as his not, funeral might have. Um, I want to do two things, which is, I've been avoiding eye, eye contact with this side of the room, which I promised to get to. Um, and I also really want to thank um, two audiences. First, the guests in the overflow room who were watching it on TV, but not here. Um, thank you very much for um, sitting through it. I hope it um, was as fun there as it was here. And second of all, to thank folks who are watching this streaming live or who will be watching it, hopefully tens of thousands of you in the future will have persisted all the way through to the closing moments here. So let's get in um, one last question. Uh, Sir, in the blue shirt. Um, this is for <coughs> Bob and Carl. I understand and appreciate the conservative journalistic standards of the Post, but I wonder if you could each individually say whether there came a point in time during your Watergate, Watergate reporting that when each of you became convinced uh, that Nixon was personally involved and responsible for this, even though the Post wouldn't print it, and if so, what were the facts that caused you to come to that it's, belief? It's, it's a great question, and, and here's the answer. Uh, five floors up here, Woodward and I would get together every morning before we were going to write a story, get our ducks in a row. We had a kind of good cop, bad cop routine. You'd guess who was the good cop, who was the bad cop <laughs> that we would present to the editors uh, so that we could get in the paper what we thought belonged in the paper because this was a conservative uh, pull toward making sure that everything was safe and sometimes we thought uh, they were a little too conservative. And uh, within 10 weeks, we had found out that there had been, of the break-in, there had been a secret fund uh, that paid for the bugging at Watergate and other undercover activities against the, the political opposition, and that it was controlled by, among others, John Mitchell, the former Attorney General of the United States, uh, and Nixon's former law partner, and uh, we were about to write that story. And as Ben Bradley said, you know, to, you're about to call the, the Attorney General of the United States a crook 
There, there has never been a story like this before. So we were in there. And, and Bradley and, said, you better be right. You better be right. <laughs> so, so we would get coffee upstairs in his little vending machine room off the newsroom floor. Uh, and I put a dime uh, in the machine, which is what coffee cost then. <laughs> and I literally felt a chill, literally, not figuratively, go down my neck. And I turned to Woodward and I said, oh my God, this president is going to be impeached. And Woodward turned to me and he said, oh my God, you're right. And we can never use that word in this newspaper office ever, lest somebody think that we have an agenda. But it occurred very early uh, that this, once that Mitchell thing, that connection, and let me tell one more Mitchell story that what happened the next night. And, uh, uh, which was, we wrote the story. And uh, as usual, the White House, uh, we called for a comment, and the assistant press secretary, uh, we told them what the story was, that John Mitchell had controlled these secret funds, uh, and we wanted to know what the White House had to say about it. He got back uh, and said, the sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation. That was his response, or the White House response, because it always was to make our conduct the issue in Watergate, not that of the president and his men. So I wrote that down, typed that out on the old-fashioned typewriter, and I said, yes, but aside from that, is the story true? Did Mr. Mitchell control those funds? <laughs> <laughs> he repeated, the sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation. And I said, well, aside from his geyser in our backyard, what, what, what you know, did he or didn't he? And he said, it's all we have to say. Well, I had a phone number for John Mitchell in New York where I thought I could reach him. And I called him, and he answered the phone. I identified myself and said we had a story in the next day's paper that I'd like to read it and get his response. And he said, yes, go ahead. And uh, I began to read, and I got as far as John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, controlled the secret fund. Mr. Mitchell said, Jesus. <laughs> I, then I got a little farther into the first paragraph, by which time the drift of the story was unmistakable, and Mr. Mitchell said, Jesus. <laughs> and I got to the end of the first paragraph, saying he controlled the secret fund and what it paid for, and Mr. Mitchell said, Jesus Christ, all that crap you're putting it in the paper, if you print that, Katie Graham, referring to the publisher upstairs of the Post, is going to get her tip caught in a big fat ringer. <laughs> I kind of instinctively jumped back from the phone myself, worried about my own parts more than Mrs. Graham's. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, what well, certainly is the most chilling moment in my years in journalism, and I think Bob's as well, he said, and when this campaign is over, we're gonna do a little story on you two boys too, and he hung up. We were 28 and 29 years old, uh, and we knew that whatever it was that he was going to do, that he meant it. But what it really was, was indicative of his attitude toward a free press. And I called Ben Bradley up at home and uh, told him what Mitchell had said in response to the story. And Bradley said, he really said that? Uh, and, and I said, yeah. He said, Bradley said, do you have good notes? I said, yeah. We got all of my notes. It's, it's all there. He said, well, put it all on the paper, but leave her tit out. <laughs> Which we did. And the next day, Mrs. Graham came up around to me and said, Carl, do you have any more messages for me? <laughs> well, I think we can all go home now. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty incredible. Can, do we have a, a minute for one more question? Um, um, right there. Thanks. turn the tables a little bit and say one of the probably most brilliant political moves in the last 20 years was embedding reporters in Iraq. 
and probably the biggest failure in journalism was to embed those reporters in Iraq. And I'm wondering what you all might think about that and if you think that the rise of social media and online media is because of those institutional reporters that were embedded and didn't report what we all know now, which is there was no WMDs there. I don't, well, think, I don't think the WMD question came up with the embedded reporters. I think that's apples and oranges, if, if I'm correct. And uh, I think the embedded reporters did really a good job in reporting uh, what action was taking place. And I don't think it, I mean, what the soldiers were doing and the service people on the ground is executing a policy that had been decided by President George W. Bush supported by three quarters of the members of Congress. So I, I don't, I, I think the reporting, that embedding uh, worked in very many ways and I don't think it connects to the social media, I'm sorry. Reporting that was terrible, or lack of reporting, was in not doing a more skeptical job, particularly at the New York Times, particularly at the Washington Post, the major institutions uh, that could have perhaps I mean, it's a very difficult story also because there were serious intelligence people who did believe uh, that he had weapons of mass destruction and, the, and evidence that, that he wanted us to believe But I put that. myself, but, just in but, fairness, yeah, on, yeah. on the list of the people we who all? did not dig hard enough into that story about WMD and I fault myself mightily for not being more aggressive on it. In fact, uh, ran a story on the front page of the Post before the war saying there's no smoking gun intelligence that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. It's one of the many cases in which I should have read what I wrote. Uh, because when you say there's no smoking gun intelligence, that means you don't have hard evidence. And if you don't have hard evidence, you really don't have much. And I, in particular, who was reporting on that uh, in detail, should have been much more aggressive uh, in doing it. And I think that's kind of one of the lessons we're talking about. You've got to take some subject and drill down total immersion reporting. And it takes time, and it always calls on the, the patience of the editors and the people who run the news organization. Great. Well, um, are, if, we're, if we have time, we'll take more. One more. One more. Um, let's do it over here. Sir in the vest right there. Thanks. But what, do wait for the microphone or else people won't be able to hear you. Yeah, there was a question. Is this on? Yes. Yeah, there was a question that you brought up before that I don't think got answered. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I wanted to hear their answer on. And that is... Imagine that we had another president who had the ethical um, uh, construct of Mr. Nixon. Not necessarily his whole personality, but his, his willingness to violate all the laws, to misuse all the government, all the things he did. Is there any reason to believe he wouldn't be as successful today as Nixon was back then at doing all the bad things that Nixon was able to do? Well, I go back to, the, to this notion, unfortunately, that if history doesn't work, I think we don't know. What we do know is that there are some pretty terrific reporters around, uh, that we have a media configuration uh, that is a mess in terms of some of that reporting getting through and getting out there, that uh, we have a situation with people receiving the information who uh, to much too great an extent and different than in Watergate, as I mentioned earlier, are more inclined to put it into boxes of left, right, Democrat, Republican, uh, Catholic, Jewish, whatever, uh, instead of having an open mind. We have a different culture. So I don't think in this culture, whether journalistic, political, or the larger culture, we could know the answer to your question. Anybody else want to take a yeah, crack I at mean, it? Yeah, but, but quickly, I, I, I think um, I, I'm optimistic about that. I think the news organizations, I mean, uh, if I may say, uh, this one, we have a new owner who's putting money into uh, expanding. Just talking to Marty Barron, our editor, he said this year hired 
60 new people in the newsroom. Uh, I mean, I mean that, if that is a great thing, and there is a sense of let's drill down and position ourselves so if something like that happens in the White House or the IRS or wherever it might be, we will send people who will have a method and a procedure to talk to people and listen. I mean, you know, let's. It was Carl, when we were working on Watergate, said, these people won't talk in their office. Let's go see them at night. Let's knock on the doors without an appointment. I asked a group of reporters the other day, how many of you have gone in the last five years to somebody you wanted to talk to and knocked on their door at home without an appointment? Zero hands went up. It, uh, when I was working on the fourth Bush book, there was a general who would not talk. Emails, uh, messages, intermediaries, nothing. And so I found out where he lived, the Bernstein method. And uh, when do you go see a four-star general at home without an appointment? Uh, I think 8.15 on Tuesday is, <laughs> is the time to go because it's not Monday, it's not the end of the week. 8.15, he probably hasn't gone to bed. You know he has had his dinner. So I knock on the door, and he opens it, and he looks at me, and he says, are you still doing this shit? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say anything, because <laughs> I knew he was sincere. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he got a disappointed look on his face. And then it kind of went, come on in, and sat for two hours and answered not all, but most of the questions. Why? Because someone showed up and said, want to listen to your account of what occurred. And he went from a firm no to maybe 0.2 seconds and maybe to a yes in one second just because somebody was there. And What's the lesson? I don't know what you do, but if I want to find out and you won't talk, I'm going to be knocking at your door, even at 71 years of age. Uh, I, I, want to say it's, I want to say this is um, the most fun I've had in ages, and thank you, thanks to all of you, Bob, Ken, Carl, Elizabeth. This has been a just absolutely terrific event, thanks to your thoughtfulness and knowledge and memories of this amazing moment that is amazingly 40 years ago. So um, we can be back and revisiting it 10 years from now, and hopefully 20 years from now. Not so thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you all very much. You're good. Huh? You're good.